Thank you everyone for being here, as I mentioned during the COVID briefing, it's really awesome to be able to, to get into the room together. It's um, been a, a busy few months rolling uh, to put this, this community together, so it's really awesome to see that it has come together finally and that we're all here. So I'm just going to share my screen, Kia Koto, those on the um, online, just share presentation. So I'm Emma Hunter. I have been on the ACCA committee this year as uh, one of the communications managers. We are here, but also give a shout out to Matt Perry, who's also on the comms team and put up the, the item. I also finished my master's research, which, as we mentioned, looks into pre production um, pellet pollution um, in the public industry in Kentucky Christchurch. And then for the past year, I've been program coordinator for a sustainable coastline as well. So thank you so much for, for coming into the space today. The purpose of this um, presentation is just to give you a little bit of an insight into what APA has been up to in the communication space. And um, just give you a little bit of an insight into what we've been doing over um, the past year or so. So the main way that we engage with our members is monthly meetings, which this year have been Thursdays from 12 to 1 p.m. Um, we've seen perhaps a little bit of a drop off in attendance on monthly meetings this year. So we're really keen to hear what members need from these meetings and on what time suits, suits you all best. So if you have any feedback, that is very much welcomed. Um, but just to show you what we have done at these monthly meetings, um, January and February were general reflections of the year and welcoming new AFA members. We then have the annual AGM um, in March. So if anyone is interested in being on the AFA committee next year, we will be looking for new recruits. Please do come up and ask the committee. We're, we're happy to let you know what that would entail um, and share what rules are available. We're always looking up for people to put in April, we had our first um, guest speaker, Romilly, come in uh, from the Kiwi Golf Drive. So thank you very much to Romilly for, for sharing um, that with half the members. In May, we had Emma Burson and Ki Wen Wong from the EnviroPass conference, which was held in Wellington, um, and they came to share what they were up to at that conference. Then for June and July, we tried something new. We tried a bit of a workshop so that it was um, a little bit more interactive than our standard meetings. We workshopped 10 key questions on plastic pollution, which previous ACA committee members have put together. And I'll be revealing the answers to those quite shortly. In August, unfortunately, we did have to cancel this meeting because we didn't have enough interaction from members of what we should do for that meeting. Um, and again, attendance dropping off. So this is just to say this is an opportunity for APA members to share their work or even not necessarily APA members if you have colleagues or panel or friends who are doing something um, really positive in the plastic pollution space. This is the platform to be able to come and share it. Um, so please, again, do keep in touch with us for that. In September, we had Christina Farley come and talk about preparations for the first global plastics treaty meeting, which happened in Europe, right? As that happens, and um, Christina will be following up with that with us about that um, on Monday. And then in October, we had a plastic pollution definitions workshop, um, putting together key words that are used in the plastic um, fight against plastic pollution or the plastic pollution industry, and APA putting together robust definitions that we all agree on. So that's still a work in progress, I think, but hopefully once it's published, we'll get that up on the website for people to be able to, to use in general. So that was our monthly meetings this year, and then November and December have all been hooey, so 
these two days count as two, two monthly meetings. And then we have, most importantly, the great social media revival. So Matt has come on board. He has dusted off the logins and has done an amazing job um, of our social media. So I hope that you're all following um, Apple on social media. And if you're not by the end of the conference, you all will be. Um, he's done a really, really amazing job. You can see um, on our Instagram overview, we've reached over a thousand percent increase uh, in the <laughs> Amazing. Um, and just to give you an insight into what folks were getting the most interaction, um, Matt posted about Lorella and her amazing artwork that she creates and how plastic pollution she finds. And then also Matt um, posted about um, the research I did into pre-production power pollution. So what this is really saying is that people want to hear about what app members are doing. That's what's getting the most interaction. So again, keep the content coming, send us photos, a little blurb about what you're up to. Um, and yeah, we're more than happy to share it. And it was a similar story on Facebook. We have had an increase and in people reached by over a thousand percent. So yeah, just a, a massive thank you to Matt for all this amazing work. And also, um, Matt has created the app and newsletter. We had our first volume go out um, in September 2022. So you can see he has been very busy, and that's why I'm up here doing the, the comms presentation, because he's already done plenty of work. So this is my kind of uh, payback to, to come up here. Um, and also, uh, Christina reached out, and that there are um, the postgrads from the University of the South Pacific who are doing some really great research in plastic pollution, and they are looking for some mentors. So anyone that can like, give them some general support um, or any advice about doing research in the plastic pollution space, and if anyone in the room would be happy to do that, please get in touch with Tricia, um, and it would be great to, to share all the amazing math that's happening in Aotearoa um, with um, our friends in the University of the South Pacific. So moving on to the workshop, this is just to kind of wet your whistle into what kind of issues we're going to be discussing over the next um, two days. And just a quick disclaimer, these answers are collected from APA members and not necessarily my personal views. I'm just uh, the microphone. So if you have a really burning question to do with one of the answers and you want to challenge it, um, write it down that the uh, panel tonight will be a perfect opportunity to keep uh, that brainstorming section going um, and in all our great times as well. So starting off with question number one, why is recycling not enough? So what I have member said can be kind of boiled down into two main themes that came up when we discussed this. One, that plastic is hard to recycle and two, it's really just covering up the bigger issue of consumerism. So plastic being hard to recycle, not all plastic is recycled or recyclable. Material value decreases um, with time, so virgin plastic, it kind of can be um, cheaper and stronger than recycled plastics um, in some cases of manufacture. And it can be confusing to know what types of plastic go in what bins and what districts. Um, and that is a lot for the consumer to understand to so be able to recycle. They'd be forgiven for putting the wrong things in the recycling bin. I have certainly done, done that before, and I'm a member of ACBA. So um, if you're not in the plastic pollution space, you know, it is really tough to get it right. Um, and on the issue of wish cycling, again, it's not offsetting consumption. Um, we're not really stopping that plastic tap. And there's a need to change that consumer habit. It's a behavior change that's needed, not a change in our, um, our recycling management. And again, putting putting a um, onus on the consumer and not, not industry. They're kind of getting away with it at um, that stage. Question number two, what is the issue with rubbish incineration and can it help mitigate plastic pollution? You'll see Liam and Tristia's um, t-shirts um, related to that. And what Apple member said was it's 
it's producing carbon emissions when you're burning that coal, so it's quite emotive. It's hard, hard to think looking at that, that that's a, an environmentally friendly option. Again, it justifies the continued use of plastic. It doesn't stop consumerism. And quite often incineration plants need to be continuously fed and um, to keep that plant from going, which completely defeats the purpose of mitigating plastic pollution. And it's, um, yeah, again, better to look at the source of the problem rather than tinkering around with end of life management. And again, not as green an option as advertised. Up to uh, and question number three was well, are bio based and compostable products better than fossil based non compostable products? The general consensus was in the middle, so this was a sliding scale. So we had fossil fuels um, based takeaway cups on one side and bio based and compostable on the other. Um, so it was kind of in the middle with a slight edge towards bio based. But really, bio based is, is not the answer either. Um, the soil is not our trash bin. They do contain chemicals. Um, so we'll be hearing, uh, hopefully, you'll hear about research that's been done into microplastics and soils and harm in that. Um, our management systems can't cope with this disposal. We have, we're just ending up with tons of these bio based and um, takeaway cups, and we don't have the systems to properly manage these. There was the argument for better the devil you know. We know what's in these fossil fuel-based plastic cups. We're kind of bringing in a whole other entity that we may not completely understand um, the impact of. And again, we can't consume our way out of this problem, which is now I'm actually saying it out loud. It's, it's really a common theme. Um, question number four, how important are reusables in helping solve the plastic problem? Reusables are really important at stopping new plastic products entering um, into the world. It's encouraging that cultural shift. So it may start with a keep cup or a reusable um, plastic bottle, but that's a way to kind of get behavior change started. Um, and it encourages the use of other materials, so metal bottles um, and things like that. So hopefully eliminating plastic. But there is um, a caveat here. So Jevons paradox, um, the more reusables become widely available um, and cheaper, the higher demand, and people will end up um, being encouraged to go out and buy the latest reusable water bottle when they already have five at home. So again, um, there can be an issue there. And we'll be hearing more about Jevons paradox from Warren in a couple, a couple of presentations time. We don't want to over consume um, reusables. And what do we actually mean by reusables? We think about it all of those consumer items that individuals use. But what about reusables in terms of third party patching systems? We don't really connect that with the word reusable yet. So and there was some discussion over what we actually mean by that. Question number five What is the link between plastic and climate change? Plastics made from fossil fuels. Um, greenhouse gases again being released in the creation of these products. More flooding being created by block drains, um, plastic going down stormwater, that's an issue too. And just general damage to ecosystems and wildlife, which are interrupting really important cycles um, and services that ecosystems do for us. So they already do a lot in terms of carbon capture, producing the air we breathe, um, and plastics in the environment are affecting that. So it's not really a, a good way of saying thank you to the environment for doing those services for us and that can contribute to climate change. Question number six, what is the link between plastic pollution and social injustice? It is a privilege to live plastic free. Quite often plastic products are the cheaper items in the supermarket. Um, if low income um, households can't afford to buy a huge amount of a product, may mean just buying as you go, which are sachets that come in plastic. Um, developing countries are getting swamped with the waste from developed um, countries, either purposefully or just the way the currents um, work. And if the ocean is used as a main global sink for plastics, Moana communities are going to be most affected. And quite often incinerators and plastic manufacturing um, sites are in the lower income areas. So they can have the pollution 
from plastic creation and handling that's going to affect those communities and, and raise health issues too. Question number seven, what are microplastics and why are they a problem? Name some sources. So microplastics, plastics less than five mil in size. Um, I really like this that someone has put in there. They're the fate of all plastics. All plastics are going to break down into smaller pieces and end up um, that tiny. They could be primary or secondary. Primary intentionally means to be that small. Secondary, it's a case of them being broken down. Problems, absorption of chemicals and pathogens, which then they can transport in, in the Moana, causing biosecurity issues. Risk of ingestion is much easier um, when it's so tiny that you can't see. Um, so humans and wildlife ingesting plastic without even knowing it. Some un unexpected sources, tire dust, synthetic clothing, um, cosmetics and toiletries, tea bags, Good old bio patching, as we mentioned before, paint, um, and also kitchens with dishwashing items that break off plastics as you're scrubbing, um, which uh, goes through wastewater treatment plants. And we'll hear more about that from Helena, has been working on that project at the University of Canterbury. Question number eight we've touched on this already why is plastic a biosecurity risk? Microorganisms pitch right on plastic ends up in places that they wouldn't naturally be. Plastic knows no boundaries, it has no jurisdictions, and it can end up, um, again, in places that haven't accounted for having to manage plastic. Products are imported in plastic, quite often wrapped in plastic um, for health and hygiene reasons, and then that is transferring from country to country. And then someone questioned the term biosecurity, does it actually include the impact on humans and foods as well as now microorganisms? And we have waste colonialism, again, waste from developed countries ending up in developing countries. And again, that's having a biosecurity risk also. Question number nine, do we need a plastic in our society or can we do without them? Um, so we did actually have quite a few points on actually needing plastic for society and Rita mentioned in his opening speech we have to work out when we choose plastic and when we don't but when we choose it and um, reasons for it are largely because it's affordable and can be practical in certain situations so it's waterproof it's got a good um, water and um, oxygen barrier there um, and it reduces the cost of items and the weight of items for transport as well, which then you're using less fuel to transport plastic items because they're, they're lighter, so it can be cheaper. Um, some members said, yes, plastic, we can have in our society if we have a right to repair it, um, which currently plastic is seen as once it's broken, done, then comes the next item. Um, currently, this little alternative at scale for, for example, safe food packaging and um, that hygiene issue. Um, someone mentioned health care to so prevent cost contamination and um, single use plastic um, is handy in those situations. Um, but then the main thing is we really need to challenge, start challenging that view that plastic is the best material in certain situations and providing the logistics to support that change and the education and, and facts around alternate use of material and how it is still safe. And there was a point that as long as we have plastic, it will be mismanaged, and um, which passes into the environment and so poses a risk. And finally, how can activism um, help tackle plastic pollution with some examples? We have Greenpeace and the giant uh, Todoa down at the beach there and it's just instantly eye-catching, it's emotive, it raises issues um, to the public who may not have necessarily come across that issue and they can really get behind it. An example of that was a plastic bag ban, that was really a movement that came from uh, bottom up, fishing for that to happen um, and it really mobilizes educated citizens to stand up and be heard by governments and um, with these acts of activism. And that can start from school projects that are, are Tamariki led. And we really want to be encouraging um, as many of our systems to, to be aware of global systems, to be aware of what's happening with plastic pollution um, and take 
take that change into their own hands, for example, voting with their wallets every time we, we choose to not buy plastic, that is a symbol that we are choosing a more environmentally friendly um, alternative. So those are the 10 questions that we workshop. Those answers are not extensive, but it's just good to kind of ignite a bit of discussion. And thank you very much for listening. This is going to be continued tonight. So if you have any thoughts or any secondary questions that have popped off of those, um, please write them down and you can ask it at the time of tonight. But thank you very much for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Um, yeah, it was, it's been really fascinating to kind of really dig into some of those issues and questions more deeply. And that, of course, it's all a work in progress. So, really, really interested in, in everyone's reflections on some of those issues. Um, and yeah, we didn't, you know, not all those answers were unanimously sort of agreed upon. So, it's, it was very much an opportunity to, to discuss and, and diverge in the opinion uh, as well.